uh, I will be talking about the uh, use of FPGAs in SDRs. Um, we've had quite a <laughs> list of presentations today, and um, a few of them have gotten into the fact that the computation aspect of SDR can be quite intensive. And as you increase the amount of bandwidth or as you increase the complexity of the modulation or demodulation operations that you're trying to do, um, you can rapidly start requiring you know, large servers or very intensive um, GPU-based processing, stuff like that. Uh, and there's an aspect which most SDRs have already inside of them that is being leveraged a little bit, but which there's a lot of room for SDR in general and for uh, amateur radio in particular to make use of, and that's the FPGA. And so I'm going to be doing mostly an overview talk starting with um, what are FPGAs, how do you program them, some common DSP elements, and then moving into more of a specific architecture, which uh, Edis uses extensively internally, um, but which is all open source and available, um, integrated with GNU Radio, uh, and which we're starting to see some other people's applications starting to make use of. Uh, and then some example applications at the end, uh, including a video if we don't run out of time or you're not extensively bored. Uh, so who am I? I'm Derek Kozell, uh, originally from the United States. Uh, my license is AG6PO, uh, though soon, hopefully, I will have a UK-based call sign since I moved there recently. I got into amateur radio during university, and one of the first things that I picked up was an SDR. Uh, it was, in fact, a USRP-1, um, and then we also had a Flex Radio 1000. And so right from the beginning, I'm, I've been using SDRs, and they've been a great uh, learning tool for me. And so I'm really glad to see that there are low-cost options, transceivers, and they're all out in the hall, and that they're becoming a growing thing. Uh, and then, really, it was amateur radio that got me into radio, and it's become a career for me. So I've used SDRs um, as cellular base stations, um, done distributed sensor networks, and now I'm doing general purpose SDRs. So what are FPGAs? Uh, they're integrated circuits. And what's interesting about them is that, like any other integrated circuit, the actual hardware element itself cannot change. Physics, you know, you have the silicon laid out in a specific form. However, if you think of something like RAM, you can store information into it and retrieve it later and do operations on that. And so you have this dynamic element. And so what Mostly Altera and Xilinx, although there are a bunch of other manufacturers that have come and gone, and there's some here around as well, uh, is what they've done is they've combined this RAM aspect where you can program into the, into the hardware and then look up tables. And so you can create very complicated logic structures. Um, and there's a variety of different programming environments for this. And what this allows you to do is inform the hardware how it should behave given a set of inputs. And this can be as simple as something like a switch or a MUX, or as, as complicated as like an FFT or a four, full OFDM modulator. And so this is the general structure of what's inside. If you look up online FPGA internals, you'll get a million different images. And everyone's moved the blocks around. And then it gets into painful detail later on. Um, and I've held that off. Xilinx and Altera have thousand page long reports all about that. But the nice thing is you don't really need to know a huge amount about the internal structure. The tools deal with that for you. But why do you use FPGAs? We have CPUs. They're very powerful. Um, and we've been able to do pretty much anything you want with them. They're very, very flexible. But they're relatively inefficient, actually. Uh, they're mostly designed to do serial operations. We've seen more and more SIMD operations come in where you can say, do this same operation on 16 integers or 16 floating point values, but they still have to go in, into RAM, fetch that out, decode the instructions, and do all of this. And there's an overhead with that. You go to GPUs, and you load a kernel into there, and you can very rapidly do extremely parallel operations. But it's really designed to be more of a graphics processor than it is a general purpose computation. This has been changing with CUDA. But there's an increase in the amount of complexity and knowledge that you need in order to make that work well. 
and you're still going to be constrained by the CPU itself because you have to get the samples in and out. Um, and there's some workarounds for that. Moving on to the next step, and you get FPGAs. FPGAs, being a single chip, um, are very, very convenient. They're relatively inexpensive compared to a CPU able to do the same operations. Uh, and they're extremely good at doing one thing very fast. Uh, and the nice thing is that you can change what this one thing is because it's reprogrammable. And then at the far end, you get application-specific integrated circuits. And that's if you're going to do this one operation for 10,000 devices, you might start looking at getting an ASIC. But you've lost all of your flexibility, so you'd better not make an error in it. Um, oh, and just uh, as a note, the energy required for any specific operation um, generally decreases as you move uh, left on this graph, right on that graph. Uh, and so what's inside? You have a set of basic resources. Um, the fundamentals are generally the lookup tables, flip-flops, uh, and multiplexers. And then, uh, so the lookup tables are the bit that's doing, are the piece of hardware that's doing the operation of, okay, you've programmed it with a logic table and it receives a one, a zero, a one, and it knows that it should do an and operation and then an or and give you out some result. And that can get quite complicated. Uh, Flip-flops for storing a piece of data for one clock cycle or more. Uh, and then multiplexers, how do you move the data around? Uh, block RAM is a built-in element of actual RAM, still usually implemented using flip-flops, but much more efficiently for storing larger amounts of data. This is usually measured um, each block RAM cell is usually about 16 kilobits worth of information. And they provide, the manufacturers provide some access to say, I want to read out a word. And you could say this word is going to be 16 bits or 32 bits or 64 bits, however you like. Um, and so it's, it's a matter of efficiency. And then you get into what's particularly interesting for those of us in the room, the DSP slice. And this is a block pictured here down at the bottom, which can take some inputs add or subtract some of them, multiply, uh, accumulate, do another add, subtract, or a logic operation, um, and then multiplex the inputs in. And it has a little bit of RAM in it so it can accumulate a value over time. And this is really the bread and butter of how we can do digital signal processing in an FPGA. And so the more you pay for an FPGA, the more of these you get. Uh, and the nice thing is, if you want to get every last ounce of performance out of an FPGA, you need to know the 500-page document that covers how to use these in every detail, uh, which is why I throw the magic in there, um, because people really can get crazy performance out of it if you really understand the details. But this, the compiler, the software that you use for designing these uh, applications will generally figure out what's best to do. So how do you program it? Uh, <laughs> sorry, fragile is a, a missing element from my slides. Um, the two main languages are Verilog and VHDL. Verilog tends to be a little more popular in the United States, VHDL more popular here in Europe, uh, and I'm not quite sure about the rest of the world. Uh, Verilog has had an update called System Verilog, um, which has some adoption, but it's certainly not completely replaced Verilog. Uh, and generally, they're interoperable. Uh, you're working with the same hardware, the compiler is smart enough, you can describe in either of these languages, or both of them, if you're feeling uh, a little bit painful, uh, and describe your hardware, and it, the compiler will deal with that and provide you out a bit file that you load onto the FPGA that will then start doing your operations. Um, there are some of these other languages. Um, PyHDL is a Python-based <laughs> uh, hardware description language. Uh, System C is another one that gets used a lot in verification and in the industry, but doesn't see a lot of ad adoption in uh, the open source environment. And just for example, here's a uh, four input, one output MUX uh, implemented in both Ver VHDL and Verilog. And so we can see the, the language is not particularly complicated. Understanding it takes a little bit of time, like any programming language. But in here, we're say, like on the Verilog side, we're saying, always look at these two signals, um, select zero, select one, 
and these inputs, and anytime any of those changes, evaluate this logic. And so we're gonna look at switch zero and one, and based on these different cases that we've defined, we're gonna define the output signal Y to be either A, B, C, or D. And it's the same thing on um, the VHDL side. And so you can define the bait, you know, all the way down to the AND or gate levels, but you really don't need to. Already at the kind of what the lowest level is here, you can do these high level operations saying switch case and the compiler will figure it out. Now, you can also start off with C, C++, or system C, and Xilinx, uh, the vendor I'm most familiar with, uh, supplies a compiler that will take this C, and you have to write it in a specific way, and you can't you know, start throwing in network stacks and libraries and stuff like that. But it will take this C or C++ and compile it down into uh, a bit file um, here, which can get uh, exported, and RTL is the register transistor logic it's the actual um, inside of the FPGA is generally RTL, uh, or referred to as RTL logic. Um, and that can all get put down. Or you can run it in simulation, which is great for testing when you don't want to spend the whole time required to export out to the hardware. There's LabVIEW FPGA, which is a graphical-based environment. Um, a whole, you know, LabVIEW made by National Instruments, uh, which Edis Research is now part of. Um, has f for many, many, many years, decades, uh, been creating this graphical environment where you can drag, drop, connect wires, and they provide pre-made blocks built to go on the FPGA to do different operations. Um, so this, you know, it's hard to see on here, but you can go look it up if you're interested. Um, and just as a matter of interest, uh, there are lower cost licenses. It's not free um, for home usage. Um, MATLAB Simulink, much the same idea, and again, they have a um, low, lower cost hobbyist license as well. Uh, and so here you can see kind of a much higher level um, setup. They're creating some binary data, they're modulating it using um, DBPSK, putting it through a raised root sign uh, cosine filter, and then transmitting out to an SDR, and also taking a look at it just locally on the host. Um, and so you can see we're getting basically noise in BPSK, and then you can see the modulated data in the FFT. So those are different ways of programming it. Um, and the one I'm most familiar with is actually just writing Verilog. I, it's an acquired taste, but it's, the learning curve actually isn't that bad. And there's good tools for dealing with it. And there's some open source tools which have come out, which is very nice, though they only target very small devices at the moment but hopefully that'll change over time. It's been very locked into a proprietary environment up till now because you need such intimate knowledge of how the hardware works in order to make it work at all or make it work well. Uh, so I've lost my example transceiver, so I'll just quickly pull that up here. Um, this is an example of what the inside of a um, software-defined radio with an FPGA might look like. So on the side here, we have the analog realm, um, you know, a transmit on the top side and a receive on, dedicated receive on the bottom, LNAs, programmable attenuators, devices that we're probably quite familiar with in the room, uh, then a quadrature demodulator, and two ADCs. Really the bread and butter of software-defined radio. Um, and incidentally, this, this image here is, um, applies to almost every SDR on the market that is a full transceiver. Um, and so then you get inside of the FPGA, which is this entire box here. And I'm not going to talk really about the first two, but these are dealing with imperfections in your analog realm. You, these ADCs won't be perfectly matched. Your low-pass filters, quadrature modulator, other things won't be perfectly matched. And so you might get a little bit of an imbalance between your I and Q channels. You might get a DC offset or LO leakage. Um, both of which will show up as a zero hertz spike um, for the ADCs. And so you can remove those with a bit of filtering. Um, fundamentally, though, they are basically just filtering. Uh, so then you start getting into a cortic frequency translator. So you have this spectrum you've received, and you can shift it left and right, which is convenient. Um, and I'll show you later why that's really convenient. 
then you start getting into a decimation chain here at the bottom or an interpolation chain at the top. Uh, and this starts getting into some of the operations that are really, really nice to do on the FPGA so that your computer doesn't have to deal with this. Um, and then some RX control and getting the data out back to um, the host computer, whether that's one gigabit ethernet in this case or USB, uh, 10 gig. So filters. Uh, it's like I said, the first things are really fundamentally filters, and the decimation will involve filters, the interpolation will involve filters. Everybody likes filters, uh, and it's nice to be able to do that on your full bandwidth uh, efficiently. And they can become computationally quite intensive if you're trying to do all these multiplication and accumulation operations on a high data, uh, high data rate. Um, and so here on the uh, left-hand side, we can see GNU Radio has a filter design tool um, which you can pick out uh, attributes, and it'll give you back a list of numbers. These are the taps that would get put into a filter arrangement, something like this. this these are implemented using those DSP slices on the FPGA. So you calculate what sort of a filter you want, high-pass, low-pass, band-pass filter, um, and where you... This can either be then done in software or put into the FPGA. If you put it into software, you're going to have a fairly intensive CPU load, uh, especially if you're dealing with quite a few samples. And we've had people uh, here talk earlier today about running SDRs on something like the uh, Xilinx Zinc um, chip, which is a hybrid FPGA and ARM processor. Now, the ARM processor on, on there isn't very fast. It's actually slower even than like a Raspberry Pi and you know, certainly slower than like an Odroid XU4 or the processor that you have in your phone. So even on like a 100 kilohertz wide channel, which is something that we might encounter very commonly in the amateur radio realm, and a Raspberry Pi is just barely going to keep up with doing some of these operations. So putting it into the FPGA is great. And we can see here, it's just a few DSP slices, and it's going to run. And there won't be any CPU load, and your end result will be filtered. Um, and so this also comes in very handy if you're doing rate changes. A lot of the ADCs that are running, and we heard uh, Flex Radio talk about this earlier today, uh, run at very, very high sample rates, you know, 200 mega samples, 240 mega samples plus. And if you multiply that out by, you know, say it's two bytes per sample, you're getting I data, you're getting Q data, all of a sudden you're talking four bytes for every sample for 200 mega samples per second you're getting 800 megabytes worth of data coming into your computer. You can't put that onto a hard drive unless you have an entire rack. And just processing that into your CPU becomes difficult. Um, so often, we're looking at a much narrower band signal. Uh, and so we can do an interpolation or a decimation operation. And if you're doing this, you want to go from a very, very highly sampled signal down to an accurate representation of the same signal at a lower sample rate. Uh, and so there's efficient ways of doing this. Um, on the next slide, I'll look at uh, a filter that does this. But you end up with usually a combination of a rate change, a low-pass filter, a rate change, a low-pass filter. Uh, and this is so that at no point you're, you're always throwing away the data that Nyquist says that you never had. So if you're going from one mega sample to two mega samples per second, uh, in, co in the complex realm, you can look at one megahertz of spectrum. You can represent accurately a signal up to one uh, megahertz wide. Uh, and then if you go increase your sample rate, you're not actually adding any data. You're just trying to insert and fill in the blanks. So you have to low pass after you um, increase the data rate. And that will end up moving between these two plots on the side here. So here's one specific in implementation of this, and it happens to be very, very efficient. Um, this can fit into even the smallest FPGA, really. Uh, and the nice thing is, it's programmable basically at runtime. Uh, and so you have a whole bunch of stages which are just delaying and summing um, data. And then you have a rate change here. So if you're, uh, this is a decimator again. Um, I've been on receive projects for the past two years, so everything is receive side for me. Uh, you have your frequency of sampling divided by an R. So you want to go from you know, 100 megahertz down to 50 megahertz. R would be 2. 
Uh, and basically, you just throw away every other sample. And then you have a bunch more accumulators on the other side where you're, you're integrating um, the signal. And this can be quite small, quite efficient. And if you make the center section programmable, you can sit there with software without changing anything in hardware in the FPGA, without, repro without recompiling the FPGA. And you can say, I want this sample rate, I want a wider one, I want a smaller one, and do that very flexibly. Uh, now, this does have a uh, problem with it. You, if you pick odd rates, it's a property of the filter that you get very bad roll off. Um, and so your previously very nice filters, um, which, sorry, actually this plot doesn't have on it, but this is a fair representation of what an even CIC filter would look like um, compared to an odd one. You're losing a lot of bandwidth here, and it's rolling off much slower, so you're going to get um, it's less efficient data usage. Now, here you have the half-band filters, which actually require half as many taps because you select uh, it in such a way that the filter is symmetrical. Um, and sorry, I know I am just kind of rolling through a lot of DSP here, but it's meant, this talk, I hope, is going to be more motivational that this is a good thing for us as amateur radio operators to become informed about. It's a great thing for us to see ha happening in our radios. And it's something that can be accessed by us in these radios, um, because a lot of them are open source. Um, you know, the Nuon Blade RF, the Hack RF, all of these have um, elements that can start being used um, by us. Not all of them FPGA-based, but a lot of them have FPGAs, and a lot of the upcoming ones certainly will as well, because they're getting cheaper to do the same amount of work. Frequency shifting. Here really is a, a great operation which takes advantage of the fact that the analog front ends on a lot of these radios are quite a bit wider than any of the signals that we care about, um, wider than you know, even the entire amateur radio band for pretty much anything lower than a gigahertz. Um, and so if you can sample a much wider bandwidth and you have some spurs, you have some imperfections in your hardware, um, Usually these are right at the center of your spectrum where you're getting the local oscillator leaking through. You're getting um, some other distortion which is causing spurs around the center. Uh, you can take your entire received spectrum, which is the, the analog blue portion here. You can shift it such that all these central um, spurs and stuff are outside of your end target bandwidth. And then you can decimate it down. And that decimation has those filters, and so it'll throw away all the spurs. And incidentally, you get an increase in SNR because you've taken a whole bunch of data and reduced it down as so you can drop out some of the random noise that's at the bottom. Uh, and so you end up with only this bandwidth sample being sent back to the host. So not only is your computer receiving less data, but it's, uh, it has fewer spurs in it, and it has more resolution to it. Uh, and that can be implemented either using a Cortic, something like a quarter rate down converter, um, which are very, very efficient means for um, implementing this sort of frequency ship, shift operation. The first one is similar to the um, CIC filter in that you can very simply reprogram it in software without changing anything in the FPGA and frequency shift by anything you want. So if you say, I want to look at this area of spectrum and then this area, it's just like tuning the knob on the, the front of a um, analog radio. I, you could just slide this around without any sort of delay. The quarter rate down converter would be a fixed frequency um, and gets used for things like IF down, final IF down conversion. Um, so I, I haven't been looking at the slides, so I may be speeding through this. Um, but now I want to talk about uh, the RF network on chip which is this specific architecture that GNU Radio is starting to make a lot of use of and which Edis has been building into our radios in the last couple years. Um, and the idea is to create a standardized data flow so that you can have plug and play blocks that move between, that you could move between different radios, um, different radio architectures conceivably, um, and use the, the AXI interface, which I'm not going to talk about, but you can look up online if you want, um, is a very, very standard um, 
interface within FPGAs. There's a whole bunch of code that already exists for doing DSP operations with this. And so RFNOC provides a wrapper around that that allows you to um, have software access to registers, so things like the decimation amount, the R register there. Um, have easy, you could just say, there is a register called R. I want it to be a settings register. And the framework then provides you with C or Python access to that register without having to deal with all the layers in the middle. Um, and so uh, is, who's not familiar with GNU Radio in the room? Absolutely nobody? <laughs> I somewhat doubt that, but you're a wonderful crowd. Uh, so here we have at the top um, a GNU radio flow graph. Very, very, very simple. Just a Gaussian noise source running into a FIFO. And we can see here, uh, if you're familiar with GNU radio, black lines are the usual ones used in GNU radio companion. And that represents the interconnect between two pieces of software running on um, the host computer. To, to DSP operations. Here, it goes black to green. And that's indicating that there's going to be a transfer of data from the host into the FPGA into a FIFO block, which is just a bunch of the BRAM um, stacked up so that you can deal with network latencies and stuff like that. Uh, and then into an FIR filter, and that's just a green line. So it's FPGA to FPGA, very, very fast and efficient and deterministic, which is nice. Um, loaded with filter coefs, coefficients in the filter tabs, and then transferring back up to the host and looking at it in a frequency sync. And sure enough, here we see there was non-band limited Gaussian noise run through a filter. Now we see the shape of the filter. Um, the filters worked. Wonderful. Uh, now what's interesting is if you had multiple FIR filters or multiple DSP operations, it's actually possible in software to just pause and reroute the data, and all of that would be dealt with behind the scenes. And so this kind of returns again to why is it compelling to use FPGA processing? Looking at a GNU radio flow graph here, we have a USRP source, so an SDR receiver passing us out data, and the sample rate is 10 mega samples per second. Not actually tuned to anything, but it could be tuned to whatever you wanted. Uh, and then we're doing an FFT operation, complex to magnitude, so taking the complex samples and just um, getting the magnitude data out of it and throwing away the phase, um, and then doing a log 10 operation on that. This is all bread and butter mathematics. It's not complicated, it's very common, and people have written thousands of these over the years. And right now, all the lines are black. Everything's being done on the host computer and then we're running it into a, a vector sync at the end, um, but it could be whatever you wanted. Now, wouldn't it be nice if we could make all of this FPGA-based? And if we did, the complex to magnitude operation actually throws away half of the data, and so you would ha have half of the data rate go into your computer, and you'd be getting the FFT data for free, um, all done on the FPGA. So this is what that ends up looking like. Um, there's a driver. And then all the areas in green are the RF knock infrastructure. Uh, so there's a crossbar, which allows you, um, just like the old telephone system, um, to route data between any of these computation engines. Um, and these computations are, engines are things like the FIR filter block, um, though there's a wide variety of them available. And um, if anyone's interested, I can show you th what the source code looks like for the inside of these blocks. Um, it's also posted up on GitHub. There's a tool which creates all of the um, surrounding source code for you and it literally includes a header called uh, a comment that says user code here. Uh, and you can put in, you know, x equals x times 1.1 and you would have a digital gain block. Um, or y equals x times 1.1. And so we can see here, um, this is what it ends up looking like. You have data coming for this particular flow graph. You have data flowing from the radio into the FFT and then out into the, GNU, the rest of your GNU radio processing. And this isn't GNU radio specific. I just use it because it's a great framework and it's really easy to demonstrate things in.
Um, there's a collection of uh, blocks already posted up between UHD and GNU Radio uh, and the general community. Um, some of these are the common DSP operations that I've talked about earlier. Uh, digital up converter, which is a frequency shift, or potentially frequency shift and interpolation. Digital down converter, uh, frequency shift and decimate. Uh, FIR, FFTs, signal generator, uh, a vector, IIR filter. Um, some of the basics, the digital gain is just a multiplication. Uh, keep one and N if you want to throw out some of your data. Uh, you're seeing it come in too fast or you've done some operation. Like you could do an FFT and then a keep one and N so that you're only getting 60 frames per second worth of data because your monitor just can't display any more than that. Uh, and then again, you're having a lot less data come back to the host. Uh, split stream, if you want to take your radio data, split it out two ways. You could do like an FFT on one and then a decimate on the other. You'd end up with the full pan adapter view and then your computer would only have to demodulate a very small stream of data. Um, things like that. And then there's some more complicated modulation ones like OFDM and there's actually been a, a full implementation. So you could do an OFDM based channel and do a huge amount of data over like a microwave band or 70 centimeters really does have enough room, but it's a little impolite to shove your shoulders out like that. Um, yeah, and then just coming towards the end, uh, some applications which have been done with this, um, and again, this is really to motivate, like, people are using this, we're seeing it happen, hopefully it'll become more dominant, and you can do real work in the FPGAs, uh, and it is approachable. So, Phosphor, is the first example that always gets thrown up whenever we start talking about this. Uh, it was developed by Sylvain, uh, who um, did some excellent work. First thing that he did was develop it for a graphics uh, processor using the CUDA. No, he didn't use CUDA, he used uh, OpenCL. Um, and so it can actually run on like an Intel CPU as well, but it really thrives on a uh, GPU. And he's doing a real-time spectrum analyzer application. So you, every time you do an FFT, you do it on a number, you know, N samples, and you get N bins out. Uh, again, you can only really just, your eye can only see maybe 60 of those a second. And so you're throwing away a lot of information there. And so what this does is it accumulates a whole bunch of those FFTs and develops a heat map like this. And so you can see much less common events like the ones that are happening around plus four megahertz here. Um, the light blue are events that are occurring very, very rarely compared to the, where most of the, uh, the red where most of it's spent. Um, and yeah, that's a massive reduction in uh, host throughput. And so, uh, I've thrown away all those, haven't I? So here's an example of it running um, and we can see a Wi-Fi channel uh, tuned to the five gigahertz band. And this is looking at a full 100 megahertz wide channel. And the nice, one of the really cool things about this is this could be running on a Raspberry Pi. And people have done that. Uh, the Raspberry Pi itself couldn't get that amount of samples in. It couldn't do an FFT on it. And it doesn't have the graphics capability to actually render this out, even if it could do the first two. Um, and so here we're seeing all of the really infrequent data flying by. Um, and then I just have one more here, which is a little longer. Uh, so looking at a 200 megahertz wide swath and seeing um, Wi-Fi in the middle, probably a 20 megahertz wide uh, one. And then you can actually see in here, there's some other transmitter happening in the ISM band that's much, much lower. That could be a Wi-Fi access point that's quite a bit farther away um, or some other uh, device. And this is probably just a downsampled version of pretty much the same thing. You can see infrequent events on the side and then the full OFDM channel happening there. And you can actually see all the carriers, which is cool. Um, impressive is the software I use to display the PDF also open source, which is nice. Um, I've lost my header here, but um, 
the Edis Research and Xilinx just uh, co-sponsored a competition um, to use that high-level synthesis, the C or C++ code conversion to the FPGA. Um, and so there were a whole bunch of entries, and there's three finalists, and I'll show you what their projects look like uh, here. So uh, ATSC is digital television. Um, it's a different standard to DVB. Uh, though there is work going on right now to get DVB implemented into um, the FPGA. And we can see this is, was their ending uh, flow graph. So they have uh, the FPGA-based radio, a DDC, so they can do frequency shifting. They're down converting um, from 200 megasamples per second to 6.25 uh, with no frequency shift. Um, they have a throttle, which is just not right. Um, that's not going to do anything useful uh, for them. Um, but then a, an RF knock FIFO there, so again, taking the data in, that's a really interesting operation that we should point out to them. Um, RF knock ATSC, so they're having a filter that's specified by the standard. Uh, it's probably just an FIR filter with a specific set of taps. Um, a, frequency, a frequency and phase lock loop to do fine frequency adjusting and tracking. So even if you had like Doppler shift on a satellite, you can track it across with that block um, or a minorly adapted version of it. Uh, they're dropping out the DC component and doing an automatic gain control. And then they're coming back onto the host to do some operations that must have been overly complicated to do in the FPGA. You know, maybe it has a lot of decision trees or something like that, uh, or a lot of state. Um, and so it's better done on the CPU doing the sync field check, equalizer, passing it back into the FPGA to do Viterbi decoding, which is quite CPU intensive. Some deinterleaving, um, uh, read Solomon decoding, error checking and handling, um, and then passing it back to the host to do the final um, operations. And they did get to the point where they could basically stream real-time video on what essentially amounted to a, a very standard laptop or um, a high-powered embedded device. And so previously, this would have required a powerful desktop in order to be able to handle that operation. Um, wideband channel sounder. Um, there hasn't been a lot of this done in the amateur radio realm, realm, though Whisper is kind of an example of it, where you can see the propagation data. Um, you have beacons all over the place, and then you're receiving it and seeing, OK, you know, is there propagation between these two places? How is the propagation? Um, this is just a larger and fancier version of that um, where you can characterize like the entire band and do a quick burst and say, oh, the entire two meter band has this characteristic between these two places um, and operations like that. And so that was a, an interesting project that really made use of the high data rate. Uh, all of these are posted up on GitHub, so the source code's available. And if you have the radios, you can just go and run it. And a lot of them have just software-based uh, test scripts as well. And this is one that I need to find out more about. Um, the competition only ended about a week ago, and so we're, uh, everyone's still catching up on their, their work. Um, but they actually implemented neural networks. So you could start doing machine learning on signals. Um, we get a lot of distortion. You can see, um, you know, if you have digital modes, you can see various different bits of distortion. And it would be really nice if you had some machine learning in there that actually said, oh, okay, we know there's supposed to be four constellation points. We understand that something's gone wrong in the transmission or there's been some channel effect um, and you could track it better. Uh, and that was actually something I did during my master's was using SDRs and just trying to get um, better performance on uh, some of the different amateur radio modes uh, between places. And we did manage to decrease um, the error rate by about 20%, which was fun. 